It's early in the morning in Australia's APY land, and National Geographic grantee Laura Roykis and her team are on the move. From the 4x4 to the trail to steep, rocky cliffs. They're after the black-footed rock wallaby, or waru, South Australia's most endangered mammal. These small marsupials were once common throughout the ranges of central Australia. But now, because of introduced predators, hunting, and changes in land management, fewer than 100 remain in the wild. The scale of that decrease is just enormous when, the, when you think about the fact that the early explorers, when they came onto the APY lands and into these northern areas, they, um, they described the, the water was swarming all over the hills. Laura is part of the Wadu recovery team, an all-star brigade of biologists, zookeepers, vets, and indigenous Australians dedicated to saving these imperiled animals. When they capture a wallaby, a runner carries it down to a waiting vet. Lift. First, he sedates his furry patient with gas to keep her from hopping away during the examination. This is no ordinary checkup. They're looking for females with babies tucked away in their pouches to take part in a very special accelerated breeding program. Reproductive specialist David Taggart explains. There's a technique that we've developed recently called cross fostering, and it's a, a technique that uses uh, closely related surrogate species to rear the pouch young of an endangered species. In this case, the waru's cousin, the more common yellow-footed rock wallaby, will serve as the foster mother. The yellowfoot takes on the burden of lactating and nursing those young to independence, and that frees up the waru mothers to cycle again, mate, and have another young. And so in this way, we can accelerate the breeding of the endangered waru from one young annually to up to six or eight young annually. But the baby has to be the right size for the cross-fostering to work. <laughs> Unfortunately, this joey is a little too big. So when the exam is over, the researchers carry mom back up the hill and release her where she was caught. Meanwhile, back at the camp, the team has found a female with a joey that's just the perfect size. Tight pouch, large baby. They carefully transfer the tiny wallaby from its mother's pouch to a portable incubator. But not to worry, the mother won't be without a baby for long. The unique wallaby reproductive system keeps a second fertilized embryo on standby for just such an occasion. In a month, it's likely she'll give birth to another joey. There you are, Mick. Hand over the parcel. All packed up and ready to go. This youngster is in store for an airborne journey of nearly a thousand miles. It's 1 a.m. when the team arrives in Adelaide, where the joey is once again handed off and rushed to the Adelaide Zoo. Vets examine and weigh the youngster and carefully place him in his new foster mother's pouch. It doesn't take him long to find what he needs, a well-earned meal of fresh milk. And he should probably drink up. There's a lot riding on his survival. When he's old enough to survive on his own, researchers will move the joey to this captive breeding facility at the nearby Monarto Zoo. Here, he'll grow up among his own kind with a little help from some human friends. The hope 
hope is that these youngsters will go forth and multiply, giving rise to a whole captive bred generation of Wadu that will someday return to the wild and perhaps reclaim their former habitat. So would you say that's a my hope for Wadu is that in the long term, it would be amazing to have the animals swarming all over the hills as they used to be in the past. And while it's unlikely that Laura and her team will witness a swarm of wallabies in their lifetime, one thing's nearly certain. As long as they're on watch, the sun won't go down on the Wadu. Sponsored by National Geographic Mission Programs, taking science and exploration into the new millennium.